Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Gensler, uh, in your uh, written statement, you acknowledge, as you have in the past, that there are some tokens that are not securities. And I know your view that whether or not a digital asset is a security is a facts and circumstances analysis. I know your view that the SEC has very broad authority. Uh, but you've, you've also made it clear in the past that Bitcoin is not a security. Now, some SEC staff have also previously said that Ethereum is not a security. The SEC's Dow report characterizes Ethereum as decentralized. So here's my question briefly, and without getting deep into the weeds on this, and, and I acknowledge your belief that most tokens have a large degree of central control, but generally speaking, is it fair to say that a significant factor for you in whether or not a digital asset is a security is whether it is centrally controlled or decentralized? Well, I, I look to the Supreme Court that's often written about this uh, probably close to a dozen times in 50 years, and it's whether the investing public is anticipating profits, and that includes anticipating profits from appreciation as well as from, as you mentioned, rights, based upon uh, a common enterprise, but right. the efforts of that common enterprise. Right. So, so I guess another way to put my question, which you, you haven't answered, is, is it possible to have a common enterprise if it's something is decentralized? How could I have a common enterprise? I mean, it, it, it doesn't centralize, isn't centralization necessary to constitute a common enterprise? Um, it, it, you, you could have some things that are uh, uh, quite open, but still have, if the public is anticipating a profit based upon that common enterprise. So um, I'm being careful with my words here. Uh, to be accurate as best I can, the common enterprise. Are you relying on a group of individuals? Uh, and look, th these are not laundromat tokens. There, there no, is a group of people you're, you're that not, are actually. You're not answering my question, though. But you. So let's put. Let me try it this way. What is it about Bitcoin that causes you to conclude it is not a security? Well, there's it. Uh, one is there's no group of individuals in the middle. Right. It's there's decentralized. There's no group of individuals in the middle. Right that are basically, and you're not, uh, in essence, we're, the, so, the investing public's not betting on somebody in the middle or six people in so the middle. So you, you're, you're choosing not to word use the term decentralized, but that's what you're describing. It is the decentralized nature of Bitcoin, I think, is really what you're getting at. Here, here's my point, and we, I'm gonna run out of time here. But there are a lot of projects, as you know, that, I mean, decentralization and centralization occurs on a continuum, really, I think. And you've acknowledged that there are tokens, plural, that are not securities. I think it's, it's because of this centralization that you come to this conclusion. And my point is it is not reasonable to fail to provide clarity, to provide the definition of exactly where on this continuum you have a sufficient common enterprise that it qualifies as a security and where you don't. You've said Bitcoin doesn't. Some of your colleagues have said Ethereum doesn't, but a reasonable developer who wants to comply with this doesn't know where that line is drawn. So I, I think where we might have a difference is there are many factors, and so it's not one spectrum of centralization versus decentralization. What the Supreme Court, and I try to stick to, they're, they're the Supreme Court, and you know the, there'll be debates about other laws. I try to stick to what they say, a common enterprise. I think about a group of individuals in the middle. That developer is in the middle and the investing public's betting on them, counting on them, even if the token might be on a thousand computers. That's not what the Supreme Court's looking at. It's not about the token being on a thousand computers. It's just like a group of developers but, in the middle. But there's, there, if there is no nobody controlling it in the middle, that's what we, that's, that's what we call decentralized and that does happen. Um, I, as you know, of course, the, the Howey test requires all four uh, of the tests to be met in order for something to be defined as a security. Let me move on to, to another related issue, which is, um, as I said in my opening statement, I don't think that the SEC has provided a crypto-specific roadmap to the registration of crypto intermediaries. Um, one example of the problem that arises is the SEC's consumer a customer protection rule was written in 1972 and doesn't address how a broker dealer should hold a customer's blockchain private keys, for instance. Um, now, I know the SEC claims to have provided relief, but the relief has very onerous contingencies. It's time limited. And my understanding is few, if any, broker dealers have been able to comply. 
So I know you've said many times you want to have the industry, the intermediaries come in and have a conversation with the SEC about this. But wouldn't it be better if the SEC came out and laid out how you would uh, apply the rules and regulations to these novel devices? So we're in conversations with a number of these intermediaries across the exchange, the lending, the broker dealer, the custody space. Uh, as I have said a year ago uh, in the lending space, people should make no mistake. And I think it sounds like, Senator, you and I might even agree that the lending platforms are under right. the securities laws. Right. But in the exchange space and the broker dealer space, I accept that people have not come in and used what was put in place under Chair Clayton, that that broker-dealer custody rule that you mentioned. And so I've said to staff, uh, uh, let's use everything in our regulatory toolkit, whether it's exemptive orders and others, to uh, help facilitate and get this, this industry. People will not have trust in this, in this space unless it comes into investor protection. So my, I'm, I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. So uh, I, I would just say my concern is that the approach you're taking with these one-off discussions, if it if it did even result in a, uh, an opportunity to comply, it'd be this idiosyncratic exemptive order negotiated with a single company, and that's not a good way to pass rules. It ought to be through the APA and a very public process. If the chair would forgive me, I think we've been very clear through 70 or 80 actions, starting with that Dow order, the Munchie order, and many others, but, and they were full votes of the commission, not just staff. Secondly, I just look at other times in the history the SEC and the asset-backed securities market took 10 or 11 years where they did these, as you would say, exemptive orders or n relief to individual issuers and did a role at the end of that 10 or 11 years based upon all that experience. So we actually believe it's worthwhile to talk to the industry, talk to the market participants, and get them registered. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator.